Welcome to another episode of Texas Whiskey. My name is Jimmy Hayes Nelson. People just call me Coach Jimmy. I'm here, as always, with the doctor, Dr. Nico Martini, and our special guest, Alex Elrod from Balcones. Welcome, sir. Hey, are you a doctor? Uh, hi. Uh, he is a doctor. No, it's a nickname. But yes, it was, oh God, the whole nickname thing. Yes, it's a nickname. It was Let's, literally a that'll nickname. That'll be another episode. Hey, Nico, what are we drinking? Uh, we are drinking uh, a Balcones Whiskey. High Plains. Oh. Balcones High Plains. Tell me a little about this. Or should Alex tell me a no, little about I this? Refuse. Okay. Alex, Alex should tell us a little bit. Awesome. About this. Oh, is that um, where we begin every show? So we okay. uh, actually, the first show that we ever did, we, we cracked open lineage. We started with the lineage. This entire show started with a lineage. So that's what we've started this Ooh. thing. So it's like I said, we've been waiting for this episode for a while. We reference okay. you guys damn near every episode. Yeah, Balcones whiskey. Um, this is this is malt, single malt. Yes. Uh, the cool thing about this whiskey is, um, so a lot of folks will be familiar with our Texas one single malt. We've been making that whiskey for many years. Um, this is a little bit of a departure from that, being that it's 100% Texas barley, mm-hmm. and it's in refill casks, so exclusively used oak. Um, so much lighter profile. Um, you can kind of see in in the in the bottle. It's there's there's definitely less residual sugar and oak influence, uh, like especially since you've got a bottle of Froak right there right. where you can see how dense and yeah, different color. Yeah. Compare, <laughs> right. If you, you kind of compare the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that refill quality is, is, uh, um, is really nice. It, 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 this whiskey showcases that grain a lot more than the first high plains release. Cause this yeah. is the 2020 release. The previous release was, almost exclusively in virgin oak. So this is exclusively in refill or secondary use casks. So so the were the casks um were they like were the were they your single malt? Yeah, so the, uh we we kind of call a lot of those spent barrels like ex balcones barrels. So there could have been single malt in them before, it could have been maybe rumble before. Um almost exclusively it's going to be from secondary single malt um, bottlings. Yep. Uh, but it's, it's really cool to see kind of where things can go with using, um, instead of virgin, obviously being exclusively, you know, for bourbon production, almost, almost exclusively, right. Right. Using these refill casks. One, it is more similar to Scottish tradition, but two for us and just the maturation rate that we see in Texas, it's really nice to, to use those casks to impart a lot of rich, still rich wood sugar, but allow the spirit to actually get older, um, which is just a fun thing to unlock with this climate. Yeah, I know. I know that you guys are not to. Well, we're, it's going to be nerdy. Sorry, man. It's going to be nerdy. You're going to get nerdy early in the in this. <clears throat> we'll we'll, we'll go, back up and get to the story in a second. We'll but you can you can nerd out for a moment. Um, I know that you guys are very actively finding ways to quote unquote slow the aging process here. Um, just because of the the climate. climate that we have to that we have to deal with. Not the climate's everything. But right. like, you know, just, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I'm curious how, what would you say just in general, what percentage of the stuff that you guys are doing are kind of leaning on refill casks? Um, well, again, Texas one single malt is 99% new American oak. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously we do have a handful of bourbons, even though the distillery is built and designed with the idea of making single malt. Um, we still very much love, uh, American style whiskeys. So we do make bourbon, obviously baby blue is a corn whiskey. So Mm -hmm. American whiskey. Um, but there's a good healthy chunk of, uh, used casks, not only because we're, we're using, um, our own cask multiple time, but because we are then using, um, use Kentucky bourbon cask. We really like, um, from a handful of other facilities that also use ISC. Um, of course we do a lot of, you know, finishing, or whole maturation and X wine casks. So there is a good chunk uh, percentage wise. I'm not really sure. Um, but we're, I think kind of like the, the constant theme there that you're looking at is, is maybe constant innovation because we're, we're, we're not necessarily confined. We understand, but we're not confined to exclusively new Oak because we're not only making bourbon and rye. Yeah. Um, we're experimenting with so many other mash bills and and spirit types that we have that regulation flexibility. So, It's, it's interesting to see, like, it's, it's interesting to see a distillery and you guys have certainly done this. Um, uh, others like iron root have certainly done this as well, but to, to take a look at the, the, the restrictions of the category of bourbon and 
find ways that you can essentially make bourbon without doing the category stuff. So like you call it a corn whiskey, like what, whatever you need to do. Like without just, using that word the because idea of, of the, taking yes. a bourbon mash bill and doing something that's not bourbon with it because right. I don't want it in freaking two years of new American Oak or mm-hmm. like we want to try something different or right. like, you know, just kind of. Well, and I, I think that at least for, for us, and again, I'm speaking a little bit as representing the brand, but then personal philosophy as well. I think, one thing that there's kind of an ethos at balconies of the idea that we've like never arrived. We've con- we're constant and, and folks end up labeling it as innovation and maybe that's fine. That that's great. Uh, for us, I think it's just like on a constant journey, um, a flavor mm-hmm. exploration. And so we don't want to be, obviously there are regulations for a reason. Um, some historical uh, or mostly I guess historical, but for us, it's looking more at instead of being boxed in by those things, it's like, okay, well, what's the desire um, for flavor and what then, what, what does that then fall into? So it's like, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That means it is a corn whiskey, you know, our love of single malt. I mean, it's kind of like a single grain release to a certain degree, hundred percent corn and used Oak. So it is very similar to how, you know, a scotch would be you mm-hmm. know, produced because it is in copper pot stills. Um, you're, you've got a single grain corn rather than barley and it's in used cast just like they would in Scotland. So, um, it just happens to, of course, be in America. <laughs> it's a corn whiskey. Yeah. Um, but totally. we also put that distillate in new American oak because why would we not try to explore bourbon? Absolutely. You know, so that that ends up becoming to a certain degree blue corn bourbon, um, which is one of the most I would say maybe one of our most sought after special releases just because we've been making it for a while. Yeah. Folks are familiar with bourbon. Blue corn obviously being synonymous with balconies. We haven't experimented to the nth degree with corn like you know the good folks at Iron would have, which is really awesome. Um, but that's awesome. And even as I was taking my notes, so when Nico and I started this in, this entire show, I was kind of along for the ride, right? Like learning a lot. I was a, I was new to all things whiskey and Texas whiskey specifically. But every time we come back around to Balconies, the thing that every time I'd be introduced to something else, what I loved was the variety. You know, and even as I was, I was taking notes and figured we would get to this later, but we've already touched on this. We might as well jump in now. Was you think of a certain distillery and usually one thing comes to mind. And right. I think for me, just kind of being new to this world was, wow, they do this and that. And it was like, you know, it's more going to that individual and saying, cool, what do you prefer? Right. Cool. This is what we do. And so do you feel like, you know, as we kind of talk a little bit about the the origin story and where this all started, has there been that spirit of we're going to try and be experimenting? experiment with stuff from the very beginning or was it leaning into one thing and then it, it, it broadened from there, if that makes sense. Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, because it does, we, we do, we do kind of go about it, that approach to say like, Hey, hey well, what do you really like? You yeah. Know, wh- whether you're speaking with someone that's a, uh, you know, a staunch critic or someone that's, you know, but you're, but you're, your best friend's, you know, dad that, that <laughs> right. is like only been drinking Jack Daniels, which is great. Right. Cool. That's awesome. Um, it's what, what, what do you look for in a whiskey? And and I think really, at least for us, what we've seen is by us being so transparent about kind of just again on a flavor journey, if you will, an mm-hmm. exploration of, of flavor is that it opens up a lot of conversations about, well, I mean, what do you like about the things that you like mm-hmm. and then being able to say, well, yeah. Hey man, I, maybe baby blue is not for you. And sometimes that's like, man, maybe you should try, go try iron root, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, Hey, I can show you a uh, lineage. Yeah. Oh, I don't really like single malts. So like, well, give us a try. Maybe you'll like it. And you know, and I think that just uh, encouraging folks to know what they like and be willing to explore at least is, is our mantra. And I think it kind of, kind of runs through Texas whiskey, culture for the most part. Right. Um, do you feel like most people are introduced to you? Do you feel like baby blue is that that's where most people's entry point is if they're not familiar with you guys? I, I think if you've been around, um, that's a great question. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what, what yeah. do you I'm think? I'm a professional. Yeah. What a nice. professional question. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, it was so good that I've never told you that was a great question before. Yeah. So yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep my job for another week. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, but yeah. What, yeah. what, what is the typical entry into balconies? Yeah. I, I think for the most part, well, at least what we see when you look at kind of sales, market metrics, mm-hmm. fun things like that. Yeah. Um, baby blue has this, what we view as kind of a, a perplexing organic growth that, um, I mean, could be driven by a handful of things, I, I suppose. I, obviously, we have been producing it for a long time. Um, it's at a really approachable price point, you know, hovering between 35 and, 
and thirty nine dollars, mm-hmm. you know, retail. So um, it is quite accessible, especially for folks that have kind of like really jumped on the craft, you know, beer and whiskey train. Mm-hmm. You know that they see, okay, well, I'm going to spend a little bit more money to try something off the beaten path. Uh, and so I think folks have really gravitated towards that. Um, so it, 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 it is because people have known about it for a while. Uh, obviously, us releasing Potso Bourbon really jump started this, you know, this extra wave of um, attention towards balconies because of a four grain double batch pot, you know, distillation bourbon from Texas that's like it's twenty nine ninety nine. Like, wait, what the hell? I thought y'all only produce single malt. And it's like, well, no, we have always produced <laughs> bourbon. We just haven't made it available. Wait to a minute, I, th- I thought Texas bourbon was at least a hundred dollars a bottle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- it's kind of like the the cool thing about all of it. I, I I think theoretically is that you now have like the spectrum and the gamut of price points mm-hmm. um, when it comes to bourbon. Um, that I think you. Folks can, there's plenty of now Texas bourbons out there, uh, mostly credible um, to a point where it's like you can see a spectrum of price points and flavors Mm -hmm. and people can absolutely find something. Like if, if, to meet people and be like, oh, Texas bourbon is just, it's not worth drinking is like, is, is really, really silly, really, you know, short sighted. I literally had, I literally had this conversation, went to my dad's house for the 4th of July and my my stepbrother's there. He's a he's a surgeon down in College Station, and came up and had this conversation. Man, buddies, yeah. and you know, my dad was like, "Oh, his buddy said something along the lines of exactly what you said." I don't like Texas whiskey, and I was like, "Yeah." If I've learned one thing from doing this show, is like, "Cool, what did you have, and what region, and where?" And it's so hard to you know yeah. that yeah. as we've continued to talk right. about this, is it, it's so there's so much variety, and the fact that it is. Um, we are, you know, newer to the block and that there's a lot of this experimentation. It's not all Texas whiskey is X. And I feel like that's part of why we do this show is the education process of, you know, whatever you were introduced to doesn't mean that's everything the state produces either. And and I think the, the cool thing about that is a lot of Texas and Texas producers and Texas followers are, um, whether that be just Texas in general or Texas whiskey followers are, I think appropriately naive enough and aren't jaded by the idea that Kentucky is king mm-hmm. right. and Kentucky maybe, maybe is king. Um, Kentucky's totally king. It, yeah. They're totally king. Right. You know, like, I mean, of course they, well, they and they have lots of years. <laughs> they had a, they had a <laughs> 250 year head start yeah. on yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're Hundreds totally the king. Right. So, and I think that's really, it's really cool to be able to say like, Hey, look, we, we appreciate, we love those things. We're going to explore, a uh, little bit of different. And I think, again, for the most part, the folks making um, whiskey in Texas, especially bourbon, mm-hmm. um, they're they're doing it with a sense of like homage to Kentucky and saying like, man, we love and respect what those guys are doing. We still drink it. And we as Balconists still drink a lot of uh, bourbon. Mm-hmm. Um, Kentucky bourbon, you know, this specifically. Um, Kentucky and, bourbon is delicious. I mean, how in the yeah, why in the world wouldn't anybody drink right, if yeah. you like whiskey? Yeah, Kentucky bourbon is fantastic. Oh no, and I yeah. feel like yeah. always in this show, it's not about better or worse. It's educating about how Texas right. is different. And if yeah. somebody comes yeah. in thinking I've only ever, I think bourbon tastes this way, and that flavor profile right. for them is all bourbon should taste like this from Kentucky that my dad drank or whatever. So yeah, my my stepdad and my family's from Kentucky, so yeah. we've had this conversation a lot. And I was like, it was a matter of learning okay, this is made in a different part of the world with different grains in a different climate. So yeah. it's going to be, a, you know, a, right. a different animal. Yeah. I, I kind of look at it in the, again, this is just my personal thought. Um, when you look at the, what everybody, the, some of the bigger bourbon producers in Texas are, are doing, I think it's, it's kind of like a nod and, and an homage of course to Kentucky. Cause you kind of have to, sure. um, but then it's also like, man, no, no, we really love and respect it. So the way we're going to do that is put our own twist on it mm-hmm. without bastardizing the the category or the style, I, I think. Um, and so that's why I think it's really unique when you look at it and especially like with still Austin, it's like, Hey, no, look like that's a very, a very approachable bourbon. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. Um, to me, again, to me, it, it is a, very akin to Kentucky. Sure. And then when you look at kind of, I'd say it's the closest one we got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Which, which to me is really, really cool. Yeah. Um. And then you look at Iron Root, and it's like, man, Iron Root is exploring a lot of different corn profiles. They're crushing the bourbon game. Mm -hmm. 
that's a, that's a little bit of a different tweak and look at it. Balconies, look, this is through the lens of single malt producers. Mm -hmm. That's a little more of a brooding, savory bourbon. Maybe that's not for you. Oh, also yeah. down, you know, we'll say the, the forefather of Texas uh, bourbon, if you yes. will, Garrison Brothers, Mr. they're doing Dan. robust, dense, you know, uh, kind of these big bouquets of Texas bourbon. And so you, you have a really cool spectrum of bourbon producers. And then there's a lot of folks that have come online in the last few years. But when you look at kind of, I guess, like some of the, the bigger bourbon producers here, but it does all tie back into Kentucky and, and what they're doing is, is amazing. I mean, we still, we all still drink a lot of bourbon at, yeah. at the distillery. I mean, even though we're, we're mostly drinking single malt, but we, we do make bourbon, so we should drink it. That's awesome. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit and talk yeah. a little origin story here. Is your, uh, is your baby blue open? The Rangers one? Yes. No, but we can. They, well, you, you don't have, I, I'm not going to open it. I'm going to open it. Oh, okay. Now that, because I brought up baby blue. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, I, because yeah. you brought up baby blue and, uh, and, and I do I, want, we're honestly, gonna, I haven't had it. We're going to circle back around to the Rangers thing in the ballpark and that bar and all of yeah, it. There's yeah, so yeah, many yeah, cool yeah. things this going on a, right now. Uh, it's a classy way to do it. <laughs> this is a, a, a cool bottling are you, because it's messed up. Are you a professional? Up. I wasn't on camera. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's go back origin a little bit. You know, people, when I think, you know, Texas whiskey, like I said, forefathers, we were talking about this beforehand. Um, what do you think some of, like, early on, some of the challenges were for an area that wasn't known for whiskey? Like, how, how did it look even inside the state for people? Um, what do you feel like some of those early challenges were as, as Balkan just tried to establish itself, uh, being one of the first kids on the block, right? Yeah, um, and, and obviously, full transparency, I haven't been with the distillery since the beginning for me. Would you like to? Oh, sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but having spent, you know, a, a decent amount of time around Jared, um, I, I know that there was there's a struggle because it's it's an unknown, right? Yeah. I mean, craft craft beer has been around and has seen a huge, and I still think craft beer is, is booming. But craft whiskey is obviously a little more expensive to produce in in certain you know tangibles and intangibles, and so there's a lot of hurdles going around um, the production of that. So um, just the financial costs to start it up is not easy. It may, maybe it's easier now. There's a lot more distilleries now, which is really cool to see. Hopefully when you, especially when you think about Texas whiskey, you, you, you hope that there's a, uh, you know, rising tide. Yeah. And well, there's a precedence now, like yeah. there's proof yeah. that it works. And totally. as opposed to when this started, there wasn't, no, it was there like, wasn't much to say, you know, no. And, know, and that Cody's and Garrison brothers was like yeah. coming onto the scene yeah. about the mm. same time and stuff. And so you didn't have proof that no. Texas whiskey were, or that there was a market for yeah, it. No. And I think honestly, that's why when you look at kind of like the history of Balconies, no one would have ever done it this way. And at least again, this is just my opinion and thought, um, back then, to a certain degree, for for many years, it was easier to find our whiskey in California and in New York really? than it was in Texas. Yeah. yeah, and it's because at the time, of course, like you've got to pay the bills, and so and so there's a certain level of after we won a handful of awards for Baby Blue and Single Malt, um, Texas won Single Malt. Folks, you know, were kind of uh, calling saying, "Hey, I've heard about this. Can I get this? How do I get this?" And sorry, you don't turn down new business. And right, so right. there was a very um, rudimentary system of, uh, yes, rather than no, mm -hmm. and sending whiskey to places like New York and maybe even international. And is that the best way to start your business? Uh, I don't know, but it got us to where we are now. And so this idea that we were sending a lot of whiskey elsewhere because more people were enamored by it outside of Texas than they were in Texas. Now saying all that fast forward, um, Texas is our biggest state. Sure. You know, it is now absolutely our biggest state biggest supporters are based here. We've got a lot of fantastic supporters in all the other states that we have distribution in um, and international, but it start it really, and it really did start with baby blue rumble and then Texas one single malt and kind of, again, this, this experimentation of flavor exploration. That's really think, cool. Think, think about this. The, the evolution of Texas whiskey as a category um, had, <laughs> I, I cannot stress the impact that Balcones being one of the forefathers of this whole thing has had on our industry mm -hmm. in, in, in the simple fact that like there, there was at the very beginning, there was, there was Balcones and there was Dan Garrison. Mm -hmm. They were, they were the ones making whiskey and the fact that the fact that we had somebody that we, we had a group that was as innovative as Balcones is and 
just look at the skews. Like, look at the amount of whiskey and the different types of whiskey that they're making. Absolutely. And there's, there's, and there's too many of them. Okay. There may be too many of them. However, like, those who are into it... We're like, going to kill some. <laughs> so. it's, of course. That's, that's the evolution of everything. But, like, the fact that y'all were willing to try all of this stuff as these as y'all were having these visitors of I guarantee you every freaking distiller in the state of Texas at least went by balconies and did the tour sure. if nothing else before they maybe. decided yes I'm going to go ahead and do well, this I just think but maybe. like just like the the but they were the people who have entered this game since Dan and y'all mm -hmm. like they looked at, 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 at what was working and you had Uber innovation and you had hardcore contribute to Kentucky in every way possible. However, knowing it's going to be a little bit different inherently mm -hmm. and like that, that's, that's fantastic. Like yeah. if you're, if you're going to be set up as an industry to have the two godfathers be one of them, who's like super freaking creative. And the other one who's like incredibly loyal, but understands it's not going to be exactly the same because of the things, right. because of the elements that they are dealing with here. Yeah. Like that, we couldn't, we couldn't ask for better OGs in this. Well, state. I think what's so cool about it and going back to, we keep going back to the innovation and just how experimental you guys are, I feel like that's really bold from the beginning wasn't, we have to be traditional, we can only do this and this, I think that takes, a, it's a really bold step that from the beginning, it was, let's be experimental. Since we started this show, Nico, you talk about one of the things that sets Texas whiskey apart is that we weren't ever known for something, mm -hmm. therefore we can play around yep. with a lot of things because we don't have 250 years of, well, this is how it's done. And right. then you get to experiment. And I'm sure there's been there's been amazing triumphs and there's probably some stuff that was like, eh, that didn't work out so well. But the willingness to try and continue mm -hmm. to throw things against the wall, I think is why I'm such a big fan because you're like, cool, what are they gonna do next? Yep. You know, it's not just, oh, they only do this thing, which is great, everybody has their favorites, Right. But I get excited when it's like, what's the next thing or the partnership or the finishing or whatever you're doing next. Right. Yeah. That, that's, uh, again, I, I don't know if I would in there was someone at the distillery recently and they're like, Oh, we're, and again, it, you know, it's amazing to meet people that are incredibly enthralled by the industry mm -hmm. and of course by our whiskey. Um, but they're like, Oh, we're, we just, we're so inspired by balconies and a lot of other Texas whiskey. Um, we love the Texas whiskey trail, you know, things like that. And it's like, we're going to open our own distillery. And they were just like waiting for, you know, like a, a confirmation that that was a good idea. And I looked at them and I was like, Oh wow. And they're like, yeah, we're cool. And I was like, I mean, I wouldn't do that, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm so excited if you have the finances and the wherewithal and but somebody probably would have told you guys that like that, maybe yeah. like Texas whiskey. And, ah, Okay. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to yeah. step into the unknown, right? Yeah. No. No. Right. No. And, and I think I think I I I told them, it was, look, the whiskey industry is really fun. It's really cool, but it, it, there's a lot of that's that's ten percent of it. The other ninety percent can be pretty taxing. And sure. so, yeah. um, it, it was more or less talking about that kind of stuff. I mean, again, the, the, the Texas, especially Texas whiskey industry, it's it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get better, yep. right? Whether and hopefully we're a part of that. I mean, yeah. if if we get left behind in the dust, then that that's because of our our failures and short sightedness. And and so it kind of when you, when you see, you know, there, there's internal conversations about, um, you know, seeing some other folks do really, really well that have started after us, uh, have won, have beat us at awards. And again, for us, it is, uh, it's an interesting, you know, philosophical position to, to be in to say like, okay, well, we, we were part of the beginning and um, some folks are doing really cool stuff. Like we should celebrate that because we're still in the mix with the, with this and we're going to continue to do what we're going to do. And it's exciting to see, Iron Root, you know, mm. when world's best bourbon sure. and Garrison Brothers has distribution all over the country now and we bump into them all the time. Yeah. And, and for us, it's like, no, look, like this is an opportunity to say like, look, Texas makes great bourbon and it makes selfishly, we'll say, you know, phenomenal single malt. Us, Andalusia and a couple other folks, you know, we make it. Texas is known for flavor exploration, I guess. I, you know, I, I don't know if that can be a mantra for the whole state. Um, but that's at least that that's how we view kind of innovation is on that flavor journey. Well, I'm glad you touched on that. Cause one thing that keeps coming up every time we have somebody in or we talk about this is, and, and Nico, you've pointed this out multiple times is that I feel like the other unique part about this is because there isn't 250 years of, you know, established, whatever mm -hmm. it's this real sense of, 
openness and even now in some collaboration situation inside the state amongst the other distillers that everybody's kind of rooting for each other. Right. So like everybody wins. And, and I just feel like it's, you don't see that in many industries, much less in the spirits and whiskey is the fact that, you know, this mutual respect for the people, mm -hmm. whether it's that have been in the game as long as you guys have and, and kind of the founders, or it is some of the new people that have come along. Cause I know when we had, you know, iron rooter people in here, they, they give you guys only like, man, they were willing to talk, to share, like everybody wins. I, the same thing when we went down to the Texas Whiskey Festival, I just never, it seemed like everyone was like sharing their secrets to a bit and like talking like, what are you guys doing? This is what we're doing. And it was this, this celebration of it. And I thought that was really cool. I, I think a lot of it honestly comes down to the fact that if you, if you, if you are in whiskey and you know whiskey and you've worked with whiskey, you have this sort of inherent understanding this thing that in, in the back of your mind that you know for a fact that if you put the same thing in the exact same barrels at the exact same time and you stick it in a spot, they're all going to taste different. Yeah. Probably, and yeah. so inherently, like, I feel like if you sort of know that, you're a little less precious about your information because knowing the knowing the simple fact is like, man, I can tell you exactly how we do it, but you're going to stick it in some spot in your spot, your place, and it's not going to taste like anything that we make. Yeah. Because even if you did it exactly the same way, that corner is going to be different than that corner. Literally, we were picking barrels at, at Lone Elm yesterday, mm -hmm. and we were like, okay, we need a little bit more of the chocolate bomb. They're like, okay, it's that corner. I was like, okay, cool. I want a little bit more peppery. It's like, oh, it's those on the bottom. Like Those are the ones that ended up being peppery. Right. Yeah. Like it's and the they all same the stuff. The same they time. put the same right. stuff in at the same time, but they're like, Wood. that's that's yeah. the corner that makes it chocolatey. You, know? you keep coming back to what do you what do you feel like the role has been um with the awards when it comes to the growth? Do you feel like, you know, obviously you, you kind of just touched on that. I didn't realize that it was you know, it was almost more accepted outside of the state before it was in the state. And, yeah, and you sure. just feel that's just a matter of obviously awards are you know, it, they're subjective and stuff. And, and, but do you feel like it gives some legitimacy to people that may be skeptical? Do you feel like that's the, that's the boundary that it, that it helps, you know, kind of clear? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's, again, part of this is my own personal thought and opinion. Um, but I also understand that I work for Balconies and I have to be not, I'll, I'll be, I have to be careful about what I say. I just mean that there are a lot of different awards, shows, ceremonies, sure. uh, rankings, whatever. And, I think there are a handful that are maybe more credible on a national and international landscape. Sure. Like and, anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and there's an idea that, you know, just because you win an award doesn't mean anything. People probably paid for it and all that. I, I mean, we see the comments, right? We, we sure. see the, what people say and think, and maybe it's true. I think it's most, that's mostly false. Um, well, a hundred percent know it's false. We don't buy awards. Sure. Um, we don't pay for wins because why would we pay for a loss? Because we do lose <laughs> right. sometimes. I mean, <laughs> right. uh, recently, Iron Root beat us with corn whiskey. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean it, it's going to happen. Like, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so being that New York and San Francisco are hotbeds for, you know, massive competitions, we have won a ton of them, whether it was best in class, double golds, yeah. category winners, you know, whatever. And so then naturally it, there's, that's the epicenter. So it, it trickles out. And so for the longest time, California, um, and to a certain degree, Chicago mm -hmm. and New York, they were some of our bigger markets. I mean, even honestly in, in over in Europe at, at times, the UK, I guess, specifically folks had been more enamored than Texas because it was just like, Oh, I'm Texas whiskey. What? No, I'm, yeah. I, I drink, I drink bourbon. Like I don't drink whatever that is. I, I don't know. So, yeah. I mean, it, again, it, it's 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 come full circle because now Texas is our number one state. Um, California is, is number two. But, um, yeah, awards, awards are smart and good. And I think where um, where I believe it's legitimized – legitimized? Is that the right word? Yeah. Yeah, yes. so. yeah, is when you don't just win one award, but if you can win two or three or four in that same category yeah. year after year consistently – some longevity with that. Yeah, yeah, because then it shows like there's you might have growth and you're exploring, but there's such a consistent, you know, people are being consistently enamored by your whiskey that you're winning awards after awards. Like if you only stop with one, maybe that's fine. But I just feel like if you don't enter in those competitions year after year, 
a little of it's like a kind of a benchmark and a measure. Well, nobody wants to be a one hit wonder either. Like, ah, yeah. cool. You peaked then. And then, you know, you even yeah. talked about that. Yeah. Like you want to make sure you said the future of Texas whiskey. You want to make sure yeah. that Balcony's name continues to be on the forefront of yeah. that as this continues to grow as well. Not totally. like, oh, it's, you remember back when yeah. they did some really cool yeah. stuff? No, and, yeah. you're right. I, I think it's I, honestly, that's where it, a lot of times we believe it's an obligation to be a part of that conversation. And if we've got an opportunity to talk about Texas whiskey, when we just opened up Alaska and Hawaii, it's like, why not do that? I mean, mm -hmm. if we're going to be the, some of the first to do that, we, it would be a disservice to not at least talk about, you know, where we are based and what we have done. And sometimes, and most of the time awards come with that, you know, as far as like carrying that, um, what can le legitimize some of those conversations is that we've been a part of this for 12 plus years. Right. And it's not just a one hit wonder. Um, yeah. So we, yeah, we'll, we'll continue. It's funny. I, we're submitting some stuff to whiskeys of the world he, probably this week. Deadline is in a couple of weeks, so we have to get it out, but we'll, we'll, we'll submit some stuff to that. We, we like whiskeys of the world. So right on. That's really cool. Do you feel like because of the awards and the legitimacy of things now, you know, we go back, Nico brings up all the time and huge, you know, fan of, of finished whiskey and <laughs> I'm uh, a sucker for a finished you're whiskey, a sucker man. for a God. finished whiskey. I remember we stopped when we were going down and we stopped and got the dusk and dawn on the yeah. way down to the, uh, to the, to the, to the whiskey festival. I feel like the fact that it's been experimental, it seems like from the beginning, but there are these awards. And so I feel like it gives from a public's perspective, it gives you guys a bigger leash to continue to experiment or try things, whether it's a partnership, like what you're doing with Shiner, what it's doing with, you know, just different of the, of the finished things. I feel like it, it kind of, it kind of allows you to open up and be more experimental because you're like, well, that's what these guys do. And we know that they make a quality product. So we're, we're willing to like give them some leash as opposed to, Hey, we're going to, we're going to try a few more things. Right. And again, I think part of that is, is looking at Texas whiskey as the category, I guess, or where people are based being in Texas. Sure we're naive enough to say that we, we don't have to stick with the same mash bill, the same barrel profile, the same this, mm -hmm. um, in order to mimic exactly what some other, you know, major regions, Kentucky and Scotland, um, we don't have to follow exactly that. We can look at it and say, okay, cool. You know what? In homage to that, we're going to stick with, you know, things that we, we have to, um, but then we're going to experiment a little bit and we're going to tweak this and that without again, bastardizing or, any of the spirit categories or anything. Not that I really think anybody's doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't thought about if anybody's doing that. I don't care if anybody's doing that. Um, it's really silly if they were anyways. Thing, but <laughs> yeah. Whiskey. Yeah. The, 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 cons the consistency is, I think the consistency and the recency is, mm -hmm. is, is, is the recency. Is that a word? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, I feel like up. as the show gets longer, and we're words just going to keep asking yes. more words. Is this a word? The things um, I, the, the, but the, but the, 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 um, how recent the uh, award is. Yeah. It's incredibly important. And sure. I mean, like, I mean, like, like you were saying, and it, it's, you know, if you've been in this category and you've won best corn whiskey in the world multiple times consistently, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and now there's, there's, uh, you know, single malts that are, that are, that are gaining awards and, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, I don't know. We have we have another godfather in our state that like that won an award with his vodka a long time ago, and he likes to make he likes to make uh, commercials that talk about how it's better than everyone you you're thinking of. Right. That's, that's fine. Yeah, you won it in like I don't know ninety seven or whenever the <laughs> hell you <used>, like <laughs> yeah. like well before the children were born. Right. Yeah, you yeah. know. So. It is what it is, but like yeah. you know, it, it, the the thing that my my personal opinion on awards is like the fact is if they didn't matter, nobody would enter, and everybody. No, enters, I get that absolutely. So I just wanted to know how much. Matter. You know, it's just like if something wins best picture, doesn't mean it was your favorite picture that year, but there Ooh. was enough people yeah. That, yeah. that believed it was best picture. Yeah. I wanted to touch back on this since, since we've opened this baby blue and, yeah. and the Rangers, so I made my first trip out to whiskey's uh, meant to be open, Jimmy. I, I know. I'm Thank learning you. that. I'm learning that. Sharing, as, as sharing my, is caring. Yeah. Sharing is caring. <laughs> Uh, but I made my first trip to the to the new ballpark, and I just, you know, yeah. we were out. So, well, Texas Live. So I'd never been into Texas Live, yeah. and I sit out there, and I see this huge Balcones bar there, and then, you know, they're talking about the bar inside. The th and I was like, ah, oh, that's really cool because, you know, as someone, you know, sporting events, man, I've never been a big traditional like, beer guy. And stuff. So be able to go to, like, a sporting event and get, like, quality 
whiskey at a place and to see there's sponsorships and a partnership like that. And then all of a sudden you see, you know, this baby blue, that's the, the Rangers edition and stuff. I thought that was, it's yeah. really cool to see, you know, that, that partnership as well. Yeah. It feels, we've got, we've got pretty dynamic relationships. Um, most closely with the Rangers mm -hmm. and the Houston Astros. Um, but then we've also got very good relationships with folks connected to the stars and the Mavericks. Nice. Um, but specifically uh, the Rangers, they, they, they're a really great organization. They've got really good people. Obviously the baseball hasn't been the best of the last couple of years, but Globe Life Field is- They'll get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, hey, right? It's all cyclical. Yeah. Um, Globe, Life, Globe Life Field is pretty cool. Cause like you said, in, Texas Live is, is kind of connected to it. Yeah. Um, we've got that bar, and then there's the speakeasy bar, which is kind of buried down a, a level or two. It's for I keep hearing about it. I have yet to visit it. Yeah. You get to stop by, right? You get I to did, go? I yeah. did. Somebody snuck me in. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the... the we should do a show from there. That's that's the next. We're gonna only do it if on we get snuck in on that location, be, right? Be cool. Well, because <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is there's only I think it's 300 tickets, and you have to present that ticket in order to get in. Gotcha. So it's kind of like what you think of when you hear like the Lexus Club. It's just that this sounds more approachable, even though it's called the Speakeasy. Like mm -hmm. only it's the 300 seats directly behind home plate are okay. allowed to get into that, and you get complimentary food, beer, wine, um, cocktails, Balcona's cocktails. Man. Um, and yeah, we need to do a show from there, Nico. I'm, I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> I, right. and then I, I'll, I'll say from the from the beginning, these partnerships. I was like, this isn't this isn't on brand for Balconies as as whiskey producers. Like, we're not a we're not a sports based distillery. Um, not that there's anything against that, but the cool thing about it is that again, we have an opportunity, and we we believe that if no one else could do it, then it should be us to be able to step into those hyper untraditional um, systems and say, you know what, we can, maybe we have an opportunity to show craft whiskey to an audience that maybe would never find us, right? No. Maybe, maybe a baseball fan mm -hmm. is not going to find Balconies unless they happen to see this collaboration. And it's all rooted in a lot of really great organic relationships that we actually have with their organization. They, they are friends of yeah. ours. They have, we hang out with them. It's, this isn't, Granted, there are sponsorship and contracts and things sure, that sure. have to be done for any business, but like these are good people. And so for something like this, it really is purely organic because we've been making baby blue forever. They've been using baby blue, their Rangers uniforms for a while. That's right. a throwback. Yeah. It's just like the stars aligning to be able to say, hey, we could do something with this. This is really mm -hmm. cool. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Yeah. And then what makes it even cooler is that um, even though the label is wrong, it's kind of a bummer, but. The back label says six months on that bottle, but actually it's the oldest bottling of baby blue that we've ever released. Oh, I didn't know that. No, I just, well, no, no yeah. one would because I'm throwing ourselves under the bus, but it happens. <laughs> um, it's actually two years old, um, <laughs> which is like by far the oldest I, baby I, blue. I was, I was literally tasting this going like, man, this isn't as young as I thought it was. Well, the other thing I think <laughs> like, is really awesome. cool is you said traditionally this is different, right? Most of the time when you see a sports partnership, whether it's a beer, whether it's a wine, whether, you know, it, in the other stadiums, it's usually not quality, right? right? It's like, oh, this is the sponsorship. And so what I thought was so cool going in there is like, ah, here's some quality stuff that I can right. get at a game. And I was like, you know, you right next to this. a tequila owned by a, a real housewife of Beverly Hills or yeah, something. Or just, yeah. you know, a cheap yeah. beer or whatever. <laughs> it's just, you and I have talked about this for years. When we go to a game, it's like, gosh, it'd be awesome if I get like a really good cocktail while I'm enjoying the sporting event or right. a really good whiskey. And I'm like, so that's when I stepped in there. I was like, ah. Oh, Finally, I can I can enjoy a sport that I love and still drink what right. I want to drink and not make some you know have to make some sacrifice right. on what I'm drinking yeah. during the game. And, and even again, the, the model of all of that is there. It, it's kind of easy. It's here are packages, here are what they cost, and here's what you get. It's there's the door trim, so you can brand that. There's that wall, you can brand that. Mm -hmm. There's a pillar right there, you can brand that. And we were just like, man, this you is get like, every third slide on the slideshow. Yeah, right? and it's like, <laughs> yeah, we, like I think for us, a lot of it was like, ah, this is this all. A lot of this feels pretty lazy. How can we we how can we lean into this even more? And so the Rangers, um, they said, hey, we've got this opportunity. Don't really know what to do with it yet. We've kind of got an idea. What do y'all think? And we were like, oh yeah, okay, we're, we we want to lean into this. And so. Um, again, I know Nico, you've been into the speakeasy, but it, it's really cool because they, we, we told them like, Hey, you need to come to this distillery. 
become immersed in the distillery brand, if you will. Kind of your culture. Yeah, feel yeah. it out, have an understanding of it, and then let's talk about design. And so they they appropriately, we believe, appropriately brought in a lot of different elements from the distillery um, with some of the old vaults because it's a fireproof storage company, some of the, a lot of the textures and feels and colors. And they replicated a lot of that in order to like really bring that sense of place to the the speakeasy. And I feel like that's kind of like our mantra through like all things, whether it's whiskey or uh, a silly partnership with a, a really cool organization. And the it's fully embodied within being able to share craft whiskey with yeah. people. It's like the oldest pastime, you know, baseball, whatever. Yeah. When that's not th- yeah. even your other, like thinking other of uh, partnerships with you guys. So mm-hmm. you think Texas Rangers, this and like the stuff you've done with Shiner. Cause when you think oh, yeah. Texas beer, you think Shiner, Shiner. like immediately. And yeah, so Shiner that's been bar. really cool. So it's, you know, it's uh, this kind of celebration of the state in different, in different realms well, as well. The, well, the new one, and I actually, ha- I have questions about, um, the, the Lukenbach release. Yep. That what, yeah, just can, released. Yeah. Can you, can you kind of tell us the story of this one? So that, um, so it's a hundred, so similar to high plains, you know, which is what we started off with hundred percent Texas barley. That's hundred percent Texas barley. And it's aged in, uh, Texas dessert wine barrels, Okay, which is really cool. So that's a first of its kind, um, for us. And uh, I believe for the state, um, specifically with, uh, I've never heard of it. William Chris, um, a, uh, a winery that's actually not too far from, from Lukenbach. Uh, and so we've got a good relationship with Lukenbach. So they don't like to trademark their brand very often, allow people to use it, but they were, they were very willing for us to partner with them. And, um, so we were able to launch this, uh, we'll, we're going to do more with them. This year was a little bit of a, a quieter, softer launch because we're still kind of in the pandemic and we want to yeah. be sensitive to that without throwing a big bash right. for a launch of it. And so we quietly released, um, you know, a handful of bottles at the distillery, and uh, we're excited to, to, to see what future releases could look like with them because I think it's, it's going to be a little bit of a, a long-standing partnership. But yeah, it's single yeah. malt. So. Yeah, I, I was I was just kind of curious about the about the actual partnership. Like, it's a partnership with the town. Yeah, with the town and okay. like the family organization that, gotcha. that oversees all things Lukenbach. Did they come to you? Or did you go um, to them? It, it's kind of a, a mutual it just sort of happen. Yeah, um, they we definitely went to them and said like, would you be interested in this? And, and they were very much like, ah, oh, that's kind of strange. Um, I think, but wait, why not? I, you know, sure. and so it's kind of whenever they agree to it, you, you kind of just say yes and go with it. Yeah. Um, and, and run with, all right, let's get to the drawing board and we've kind of got some ideas and, but here's what we think. And, and I don't think I would be doing them a disservice and say, they're not like the biggest whiskey consuming, um, organization. I mean, they technically only have a beer and wine license right, right now anyways, but, totally. um, they were really enthralled by this release and we actually, we love it. We love this whiskey. Oh, uh, we're really excited to, for it to, again, it just came yeah. out. I think there's still a little bit left at the distillery. Um, I'm, I'm a sucker for a finished whiskey. You man. are. I, yeah. can, I cannot wait no, to try it's, this. It's, it's, One it's thing I hadn't cool thought about whiskey. just tonight, just cause I was looking at the bottle of Grayson over there is I'm mean, at Nico, this question for you. So because of the history of Balcones willing to be experimental, all these different partnerships is, and then obviously being godfathers of, you know, the brand and of being, you know, in Texas whiskey. Was that one of the the initial appeals as far as when you guys were putting that together? Oh my God. A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. No, what the, as, as Cause it soon seems as so open. That's what I say. Like, <clears throat> not everybody be open to, ah, we do. We want to make a blended whiskey with other Texas distilleries. Yeah. And obviously yeah. like, it was a great choice. So yeah. I mean, like, like li- literally, once once uh, Iron Reed said yes to it, they were like, "Well, who do you want to work with?" I'm like, "Well, start at Balcones, and then we'll go from there." Yeah, and um, just you know, like the 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 history, the the I mean, you guys are awesome. It's it's I I, I figured y'all would be into the idea, yeah. and like I said, it helps. We we work very well with. Uh, the licorice family. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So yeah, they were, they were, uh, it was, it was absolutely part it's, of it. It's and a cool concept. It's yeah, totally. It's, it's it, very much so. And I mean, just like, I, I feel like, um, I don't know this, the, 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 the Grayson story, I'm doing everything I can to make it more about, to make it like Texas, all about Texas. And you know, yeah, it's very it much a, a celebration of Texas much, whiskey. Absolutely. Very much so. And so, um, and because of that, I want to, I want a balcony's end, like no, no question. As yeah. long as, as long as it worked in the blend. Yeah. You know? So like, yeah, I mean, we definitely, uh, we tasted a whole bunch of them and there were, a there were others life. that I kind of wanted in, but yeah. it didn't work for the blend. So, they, sure. so it didn't wind up, we didn't further the conversation because it wasn't quite what we were looking for. 
So, you know, it is what it is, but like, just, just like the, um, I feel like the, the, the Rangers thing, it's an incredibly cool opportunity for, um, you guys to further the conversation about Texas whiskey, which right. is, which is all I'm into right now yep. in general. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you, you have an opportunity like with this and being in that spot, it's, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like only the 300 tickets that are super expensive and behind the home plate. It does not feel, it just feels like a, feels like a cool whiskey bar. bar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, it's, it, it feels like exactly what y'all were hoping yeah, it's, for. It's a cool spot, but it, it feels, it also feels conducive to having, it, it feels conducive to whiskey right. as opposed to conducive to bougie. Yeah. And so like yeah, once yeah, you're yeah. in there, yeah, like yeah. you could totally end up in a conversation about, about whiskey with the, yeah. with the bartenders there and they know what they're talking about, which That's is great. not, yeah. which is not normal either. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like, I just yeah. work here. I just pour this stuff. I don't know anything right. about it. And I mean, yeah, it's I don't usually to go to, to concessionaires yeah. to have conversations <laughs> with whiskey, but no. like they know what they're doing. Down yeah. There. We, we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, with their group and they've got a good core group of bartenders um, cause they're representing the brand. I mean, they're in there, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And, and they're going to be in there consistently. I believe that's the only bar that they work at the, that group. And uh-huh. so yeah, spending more, more and more time with them is important so that they kind of, they can kind of grasp and feel, uh, some of that ethos in order to ho- hopefully be able to share it. Um, and at the very least speak, you know, a- appropriately to the mash bill, um, to be able to, you know, just share that with guests like, Oh man, whether they liked it or loved it, at least they can share like, well, Hey, that's corn whiskey, not bourbon. Oh, sorry. You wanted bourbon. Well, here we've got pot still bourbon. Yeah. That, that kind of thing. Cause at least then they'll know how to dissect those conversations. But how did you get into this? Into what? Into, into all of the whiskey things. Me? Yeah, you. Specifically? That's where um, I was going to start the show, but okay. we jumped in. All of a sudden we started to, I had, I had literally this okay. flow chart and we jumped <laughs> straight into like, third down. I was like, well, we're going to go with this. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. let's uh, kind of, as we're wrapping up, but I would love to know that, like what, what's your backstory and how did you end up in, in this world in the first place? Um, so my, uh, both of my parents were actually in the industry. My dad still is. Uh, my mom worked for seagulls okay. mm-hmm. um, from roughly 1980 to 2000, I think. Uh, so she actually, I mean, she had me at the hospital, but she was <laughs> a manager of a store. Um, I can't remember which one. Obviously, I technically wasn't born, but she had me while she was a manager at one of the stores. But my dad has worked for Benny Keith okay, um, mm-hmm. for close to 25 years or so. But wow. even before that, he worked for a couple distributors locally in the beer side. So I worked for Benny Keith for a little bit. So I definitely fell into the industry. I fell in love with craft beer um, in college and just kind of like be enamored by the selection, right? Mm-hmm. And fell in love with all of that. I went to art school. So a lot of that artistic license and freedom and driven by a passion of flavor exploration. Um, I was really enamored by that. So being in, again, in art school, my undergrad in drawing and painting, mm-hmm. I was absolutely attracted to the, the craft side of it all. So, um, I worked for Benny Keith for a few years and then transitioned over and, and in between I, I worked for, um, a really, really, really cool mom and pop clothing store called stag, okay. um, which started in Austin, has a Dallas location. So I helped open that. Um, they run Knox. Is that yep. that area, right? Yep. That kind of Knox. Yep. I know exactly yep. where that yep. is. Uh-huh. Yeah. So they had, they also had a Venice and a Houston location, Venice, California. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately those shut down due to the, the pandemic. And, and I, I was there for a few years and that helped me kind of bring back some more of this, like, like, friends and family, grassroots organization. Mix was still my passion for craft beer. And I was actually already a consumer of Balcones because I had a lot of friends that went to Baylor in college. And one of my closest friends, um, I was in his wedding. He was in my wedding. Um, He said, hey, I work for a distillery down here now after moving back from when he opened a brewery in Oregon. He said, I work for a distillery now. Uh, We're hiring salespeople. I know you have experience that from Benny Keith. Do you want to come work for us? I was like, man, I don't know if I'll, I love working at Stag. I don't know if I want to get back into that industry. And he's like, well, just a thought. So I entertained the idea. Um, and Tommy is now our distillery manager. Um, and I went and interviewed with, at the time, our national uh, head of sales. And he's like, oh, I think you could have a future here. You already know the whiskey. You're familiar. You've got the experience. Come on board. And so now, five years later, um, I've been stuck, uh, <laughs> at, at balcony. So, um, worst places to be stuck at. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, right. I, I think it, the, the cool thing about balconies is obviously we're, we're kind of been on a rocket ship tear the last few years, but again, there's, there's this artistic 
philosophical and execution to the whiskey that really strikes a chord for me in that creative itch. And I mean, I've definitely been very fortunate with having been at the kind of the, the, the ground floor of the sales team and now more or less bridged into a little more marketing, a little more connected tissue to the distillery um, outside of the sales world. Um, so it, it, I don't know, it's been a it's fun journey. And so about to hit five years with the distillery, but it, it's been it's been cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So as we wrap up, like, so what do you, what do you feel like everybody's most excited about going into the future? I feel like we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but yeah. really like, as you see, you know, you've been in for five years, mm -hmm. obviously they've been doing this much longer. If you look at the next five years and what I continued to hear at the Texas whiskey festival was, man, this is the year, this is the, like the, you know, the hockey, like the hockey stick year where, but it, it feels oh. like you guys are already a part of that. But I feel like as an industry as a whole, like the past, you know, past year or so, it's right. just like that's where the momentum all of a sudden took off yeah. because of of, mm -hmm. of places like Balconies that's been willing to continue to show up, continue to make high quality uh, a product that now the whole region as a whole, I feel, is right. this whole legitimacy of things mm -hmm. about to, to take off. So what are you most yeah. excited about as we're going forward? I, I think there, there's a couple ways to answer that, um, and, I, and I feel like it's the appropriate way to answer it. But even through the pandemic, it, it has been pretty incredible to see. We've opened up quite a few states, um, and we're now, I believe, in 46 states. Wow, that's and, great. And that includes uh, Alaska, and we just opened Hawaii. Um, but Did that, you get to go open Hawaii? Nobody got to open <laughs> Hawaii. There was no I'm, coconut I'm, bras. Yeah, and, yeah. No, I'm, you didn't go throw a luau. Not, not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. Luau. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like I a go. pig and some balconies and totally an apple. That, yeah, that would be yeah. I'll hold the like the yeah stuff yeah in the yeah mouth. absolutely. Um, I I I would love to do that. Uh, I'm. I'm more trying to get to Alaska. I feel like the the thing in Dude, Texas yeah. is like if yeah. you're from Texas and you vacation, you either go to the mountain, you're a mountain person mm -hmm. or you're a beach person. Obviously that's very polarizing to like throw people. You can yeah. be both, but I feel like I'm more of a mountain than a beach person. Gotcha. So Hawaii is cool. Yeah. It's very cool for the brand. It's cool because it's a volcano, but right. I would rather go to Alaska. We have yeah. distribution there and, and Alaskans. Where are you us. not? What are the four? Where are the um, four holdouts? Like, uh, we're going to make this happen. Yeah. Come on, we're going to champion the four <laughs> no, states. Do so like, I need uh, to meet someone in West Virginia? Ooh. No. Okay, so we, we do have distribution there. It's Rhode Island. Like, no, no. We have distribution there. You're in there. Rhode Island. Yeah. Yeah. Florida. No, that, <laughs> no. Florida is like our number four state, <laughs> oh, I, wow. I believe, or after New York. Um, it's uh, Idaho. Utah. That's where I was born. God, dog it, Idaho. So it's your fault. Yeah. Utah. Um, I, I think it's Idaho, Utah, and like North and South Dakota. Gotcha. Yeah, Dakotas. I think it's those. I knew it was the Dakota. We're not in Canada either, but uh -huh. um, we're not that's, in South America. That's actually surprising. I figured, um, I figured I mean, Canada law is very, it's very, yeah. yeah or CBO, it, it's tough. Yeah. Um, but I guess that we've had a lot of traction there and it's awesome. We're doing really well, but I'm selfishly most excited. Our European business has exploded recently. That's awesome. And our Australian business is doing incredibly well. So um, you can now find our whiskey in like Germany and parts of Poland and, and Spain. That's super um, cool. Yeah, which is cool. Um, but as far as when you look at like kind of like a, a good placeholder, uh, especially for folks that are going to maybe listen to this and think about, okay, well, I can't go to Poland to drink Balconies. We, we've got a lot of cool single malts and it kind of starts with a little bit about, you know, Dusk and Dawn and then Luke and Bach. We've got a, a, lot, of, a lot more single malt coming out. Um, this year and next year that are, that we're really excited about. Um, and we've started to experiment with, uh, some Texas white corn and yellow corn for mm. the first time ever. Nice. Um, so we'll continue to use blue corn, mm -hmm. um, forever, I, I assume, but the white and yellow corn, uh, mash bill experimentation we're, we're excited for, we're interested in, um, and then kind of getting back to one of your early questions, Nico, the large format casks, um, so instead of 53 gallon, which is traditional for Kentucky, mm -hmm. we've almost exclusively, not, not almost exclusively, but, but just for the most part, the vast majority of our casks are larger format. So mm -hmm. they're 59 gallon. Um, but starting in April, we filled 132 gallon, um, oh. casks. Or, they're massive. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they're massive. They're, so they're like the massive wine casks. Yeah. 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 So just to see like what long-term maturation. So, you know, the idea there is to maybe we'll check in, in three, four years, but, um, at minimum, we want to go 10, 12, 15 years with those nice. minimum in yeah. order to see what that larger format cask will do. So again, it, it's all kind of rooted in innovation. Um, but to see Balcones at the state it is now versus when I was here and I started in 2016, it's pretty crazy 
um, to see where it is. And, and I still feel like where it, where it's going to go. So that's awesome. Yeah. yeah man. We're excited to uh, take the journey with you as oh, yeah. this continues to grow. So Alex, man, thank you so much for the time. Thank this you. has been a great show guys. Uh, as always follow that dude over there. Dr. Nico Martini at Texas Whiskey Book on Instagram. Let us know what, what else you want to hear uh, from us. You can follow me at the what Coach Jimmy on Instagram, obviously. Follow Balcones. Go check it out. Go down to Waco. It's worth your trip. And as always... Dude, it's the greatest day trip that you can make out of Dallas. I'm just going to throw it out there. It's e- yeah. either go to Iron Root or go to Balcones. You will have the best day that you've that you've had in a very long time. Yeah, That's it, good. You, you can make a pit stop and go to Austin. Yes. Eh. All right. <laughs> Until next time, thank you so much, and... Cheers, y'all. Cheers, y'all.